So I came down and uh, sat in and then stayed 10 years. And, <laughs> so Yorma, Yorma was wonderful, Yorma and Jack. And then when Jack wasn't around, I think he did end up playing with Paul, who'd left Jefferson Starship at that point. This podcast is about you uh, in your journey in music. And obviously we'll talk about the new EP of coming out and a song coming out in what, Friday? Yes, yes. We have a, a, a song called, Moon Alice has a song called Let's Get Funky. Mm-hmm. Coming out, uh, it's uh, on the 11th, I think. So uh, February 11th. And yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, it's uh, sung by uh, Lester Chambers, who who wrote the song way back, back in his late 60s when he, he was with the Chambers Brothers. Really? The original Chambers Brothers. And he's now in Moon Alice, right? And okay. His son, Dylan Chambers, is, is also in the band. He's a, a wonderful singer. And uh, Lester wrote the song, but... Uh, so we, we re- re-recorded it, just like we did uh, Time Has Come Today. We, we, we recorded that, re-recorded. Yeah, I was going to say, thing, that's such a time. great song. And, it, and it's a very soulful cat. You know, it plays great harmonica too. And, and uh, so we released that in November, mm-hmm. I think. And um, so, yeah, this, is, this really uh, it feels good to get this. It's, a, it's a, you know, wonderful to play this stuff with the, with a, <laughs> the real soul singer. You know, it's great. And um, uh, and then we we had uh, uh, then Woo Woo was our a, a follow up single which was released in New Year's around New Year's Eve I think we released that and that's sung by the uh, T Sisters who are also in the band uh, three mm-hmm. wonderful sisters um, Rachel Erica and Chloe and, and uh, so yeah and then we I think I think we have a follow up single coming up. Pretty soon, uh, people get ready. Uh, originally recorded by the great Curtis Mayfield, that uh, Lester was good friends with Curtis. So, so that was um, that's a beautiful song, a song that's meant a lot to me over the years too. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so anyway, we're uh, we're getting ready to go out on the road finally, you know, again. Yeah, we've, I did we've been see doing that. a lot of li- lot of live streaming. We've been doing a mm-hmm. lot of live. Uh, we're getting ready to go out and uh, work up and down the the west coast. Mm-hmm. And um, probably around September, we're going to move to some east coast work. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Actually, I'm from California. I'm from San Diego originally, but I spent a handful of years in San Francisco in the Bay Area, oh, which yeah. I know you you know quite well. Uh, but I'm, I moved back to San Diego for a while, and then now I'm in Nashville with my family. So we we love it oh, out yeah. here. But I we've like only Nashville. been here less than a year, so. Yeah, Nashville's nice. I like it down there. Well, um, I want to. I'm I'm curious to know, like, how you got into music and everything. So, can you tell me where where were you born and raised? Uh, uh, in uh, Bromley, in the county of Kent, in in s- South London, essentially. Okay. In England. Um, I was born there a long time ago, uh, in a 1948, and um, so just missed the Second World War. Thank you. Oh really. wow! Yeah, but, I was about but, to but say it was that all was around. pretty close. <laughs> I mean, it, it bombed out buildings. I grew up in emergency war housing, uh, rows and rows of asbestos uh, houses because it was bombed so badly in the area. So, you know, we had that. Uh, but so it was everywhere. It was on everybody's minds. And, uh, uh, you know, kids, we'd be playing in old build, bombed out buildings and things and, and uh, coming across a shell casing or something from a, you know, Battle of Britain dog wow. fight or something but oh, uh goodness yeah because uh you know david jones who became david bowie grew up in the same town and um so you know he talks about this too you know and his well, he talked about it when he, mm-hmm. when he was alive but um anyway it was uh, a pretty intense time to grow up but wonderful you know and uh and then became exposed to music Mostly through, through uh, you know, when my, my parents bought me an old piano, which was nice, an old upright piano. We came home ah. from school one day and there it was glowing in the corner. And um, so I took piano lessons, you know, learned basic, just basic reading and got as far as for release and Blue Danube and that sort of thing. And um, then discovered rock and roll and blues and, and uh, sort of went off in that direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
from different bands, school bands, that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Real quick Sorry. on the pi- on the piano. No, um, yeah. I'm curious. Were you obviously had an interest in the piano? Your parents would yeah. have just bought it, or was it something that you? I mean, to come home and have a piano in your house, like, yeah. How how did that conversation start? Were you kind of poking at your parents, like, hey, it'd be well, cool if we had like a piano? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I I'd actually been playing at a, uh, hanging out at a friend's house up the road. And he had a he had a piano, and I was plonking uh. away. I plonk away at it, um, and then uh, I must have mentioned that mm-hmm. to my family. You know, they somehow knew this, so they knew I was primed for it. And so they so got it. For you. It was it was an intense thing. It was literally glowing. You know, it was just that's so cool. Good, otherworldly experience, really. You know, and they had this blind piano tuner that would come by. And he played so beautifully and uh, played classical. And uh, I've heard that's a really big career for people that are blind, actually. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah probably so. I mean, yeah, so, they, I interviewed. Um, it's all about the ear, isn't it? Yeah, so, that Sam Harris is in a band called the X Ambassadors and his brother's in the band and he's all, he's blind and he all, he's a keyboard player, a piano player. Yeah. And that was what he, before the band yeah became successful yeah. that's what his job i mean that's what he went and learned and, and his job was to tune piano yeah 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 that, that makes sense yeah that's 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 great yeah no yeah. it's uh, it's uh, um stevie wonder right? and, and mm-hmm. uh, all these guys are just beyond amazing you know yeah <laughs> but uh yeah no i um uh you know, just just plonked around for a while, but I, when I got into the blues, my older brother was was uh, um, into Dave Brubeck, and and then he he put on a Jimmy Reed album, and, or single actually, and uh, that kind of blew my mind. You know mm-hmm. those things, and um, and a friend of my a friend of mine at school, he had a his his older elder sister, his stepsister, was married to this guy that ran a record store in Bromley in South London. Oh. And he had all the old folkways recordings. And so I was exposed to Big Bill Brunzi and, and the champion Jack Dupree on the piano. That was sort of amazing. And Otis Spann, those guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, Freddie King, a guitar player, all those Muddy Waters, all that stuff. You know, John Lee. And, um, and a lot of those guys would come, come by, come to London. They liked to come over there. Uh, oh, and play. Like Heroes, which is a bunch of... Whoa any white suburban sort of <laughs> pimply kids right but we we idolized these guys you know? uh-huh. they came over they they literally la- they'd land at the airport and be like the beatles or something wow maybe not so mu- much screaming as just but like, people there to uh, <laughs> right right to really really uh, dig it and and uh with miss sonny terry brown and mcgee you know they'd come over and, and on the, uh, in the suburbs of london and i and that's, I mean, obviously other places as well. That's just mm-hmm. what I relate to. But uh, they had these uh, blues clubs, you know, you could like, you could, um, you see a sign actually. I remember seeing a sign, a little alleyway. It said blues club, you know, <laughs> and you go down and people would sit around playing records. Whoa, yeah. that's, that's amazing. I wish records. that was still cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. And so it was, it was really intense. Uh, that's a lot of people sort of got there. A lot of those um, bands that kept, you know that sort of did our own strange English version, or British version of blues, or whatever, mm-hmm. um, we, which was sort of a combination of blues and Celtic and I don't know what, but it, which I liked, I liked it, but it, uh, we were heavily influenced by by all that and, and uh, gave them tremendous. We always gave credit, you know, to try the uh, uh, the origins of that music, you know. Sure. Wow. Well, some, some, of, you... some, of the, some, of, some of the managers maybe possibly might have, uh, you know, done some problems, some thing. I don't know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But the musicians, anyway, we're young, naive sort of guys that just uh, enjoyed that music. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what, so what were you? I was going to ask you, how old were you when you started playing the piano? Oh, about eight. You know, okay. I started playing the piano and then. And then uh, I would be, as, turn professional as a as a as a as a. Um, we used to I used to play in a band. We'd play um, 
uh, clubs like the, uh, up in West Wickham and all these, and Biggin Hill, the Hillside is Youth Club. And we'd play these um, towns and uh, we'd have people like the Conrads. So it was David, uh, David Jones, Dave David was in that band. And mm-hmm. George Underwood, who became a fine artist. Uh, wow. He, he played with David Bowie for a while, but he, he painted a lot of those early album covers, you know, for the T-Rex and Bowie and- That's, in, that's amazing. Guys. And uh, he became, he's now really, you know, sought after fine artist. And so he left the music business, but he used to sit in with our band, I remember. Uh, but wow. uh, so anyway, I have a picture, yeah, anyway. But um, so, and then, and then one thing led to another when I was going to London, I was 15 years old. I, I was going to night school and I was working all day long in London. And then I, I, and I met this guy, Nick Hutchinson on the train and we started jamming and, and he was this ridiculously good guitar player. And uh, one day he showed up and with a bunch of guys in a van. I thought, I, I didn't know who they were. I thought I was going to get beat up or something. And, and it was, uh, it turned out to be Mick and, and, um, and, and the band called the Sons of Fred. And we turned pro. I joined, they said, we need a bass player. I know you play guitar, but you got any interest? I said, sure, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, then I had a different tune. Anyway, and then uh, we, we, so we found out that we were semi pro. Then we found a backer, an agent, uh, got a record company, and went pro, you know, and that was it. And that was Whoa. In the, in the early 65. And, and you were what, 15, you said? 15, 16. Uh, well, years old? I, I just turned in 16 when we went pro. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and uh, when we went, played six or seven nights a week all over the British Isles, um, you know, uh, you know, vans breaking down and um all kinds of adventures you know and but uh, as that young uh, i mean 16 to be like a professional yeah. musician and that's yeah. your gig and you're touring and everything that yeah that's how right. did your parents feel about that were they well cool? they, were, cool they, they were really supportive you know i mean that's they, they wanted me well they wanted me all the way to the end of their days they wanted me to get a real job you know of course <laughs> but um but but they were quite happy especially when i Bought them a house and everything, but but no, the, the, I'd they, say that's but, but, pretty cool. But, 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 so they were always very supportive. They um, uh, the first because we used to play uh, TV like we did. Ready, steady, goes live. We did Thank You Like Your Stars and and um, wow, we, we weren't a famous band or anything, but we did have a sort of a following, you know. And uh, at singles, we'd record at Abbey Road, which was near Maya. Mm-hmm. So that you know, things are moving. That they were sort of happy for me on one level and another level they they didn't trust the music business for good reason you know mm-hmm. and um uh so they wanted me to go to art school basically and that's what i was going to night school to study to, uh, to get my gces to go to art school and for music uh, or did you have another interest in or other interest in art well, i just i just like art you know just okay just art in general okay. and, and and uh i thought that's what i'd want to do but music took over you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, we, so just different bands uh, like Fleur de Lis and then uh, another, there's a band on there. That was a band that when I first met Hendrick, Jimi Hendrix, and uh, it's a long story. I've got, anyway, he was, um, Chaz Chandler just brought him over from America it's before the experience. And uh, Fleur de Lis, a couple of the guys were staying at Eric Burden's house, the animals house in London. And uh, I was over there visiting and then, and, and Jimmy walked in and, uh, and um, you know, he said, really unassuming, cool, friendly, uh, not on any ego trips, you know, just a really cool guy, you know. And we talked about half an hour and uh, no idea. I knew he, you know, he played with, I think, Little Richard or something and obviously a great guitar player. And, and you know, then he came down, Chaz brought him down and he, he overdubbed on a, a record we were making. We were doing the song Amen, an impression song. And, and I was playing piano on that band. The first band I played keys, I mean, bass, and then, then keyboard. And this band played piano, and then, okay. and he, but nobody knows what happened to the acetate, you know, but uh, oh, anyway, wow. and, yeah. So, um, Wow, what a relic you found that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> then later on, then I, after that band, I joined Sam Gopal Dream, which was like a, uh, a psychedelic Indian, Indo-jazz rock sort of band with Mick Hutchinson and Sam Gopal. 
um, as a trio and we played all the psychedelic clubs and, and Jimmy actually sat in with us. That was nice. And um, wow. So, yeah, we're just uh, a lot of London was really alive back then, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and um, just uh, I did a lot of session work, played with a band called Steam Hammer, uh, played on their first ever uh, Freddie King's UK backing band. And I played on their uh, first album in 69, right before I came to America for the first time. Uh, 21, you know. And just, what, uh, what took you to America? Music? Um, yeah. I, um, uh, Mickey Waller, who's a really good friend of mine, one of those guys that really was sort of key and uh, instrumental in your life for helping you out, you know. He, uh, he played drums with the Jeff Beck band was on the Jeff Beck Truth album an unbelievably good drummer uh, and just a regular little kit just like Charlie Watts they were good friends you know and amazing player but he introduced me to Lee Stevens in early 69 and Lee was in London he was an American uh, from the band Blue Cheer and and he uh, he came over to do a solo album and then so he was living in this little muse cottage with the old lady and Liz. And, and, and um, then we introduced, uh, Mickey introduced us and Lee, Lee, we hit it off, you know, and he gave, he gave me this bass guitar he had just on the spot. Just, uh, wow. Just, uh, just, we just really hit it off, you know? Mm -hmm. And then he said, if you're, ever, if you're ever in the States, look me up, you know? And, and he, he had a little bit of paper. He tore off the corner of a piece of paper and scribbled um, a diagram of Santa Monica Pier with a merry-go-round and stairs and an arrow. And that was it. You know, it said a, a door, doorway, you know, above the merry-go-round. And that was it. No phone number or address or anything. And he said, if you're ever over there looking me up, I'll, I'll probably be here. And um, so six months later, I, 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 you know, I saved up enough money and and uh, got there and uh, um, so anyway, it's a long story. I got there and uh, yeah. uh, they were still there. We played on Venice Beach and uh, used to rehearse there and, and then just formed, we formed a band called Silver Meter, mm -hmm. came forth to San Francisco and Big Sur and ended up going back to England you know, to record. And uh, so, yeah, it was, and then I could go on. I mean, <laughs> pretty, pretty boring. Uh, no, this is, in, this is incredible. Yeah. I appreciate it. Like, wow. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, 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 just the, the history here with the, the people that you've met and, and the artists that you've worked with, like, it's, it's, it's so cool. And you've also, I mean, around that time was yeah. when you were doing, uh, that's probably around the time when you started playing with Rod Stewart as well. Right. When you got um, back. Yeah. I was, I was with, the, I was with Silver Meter and then we went to England and then, uh, Mickey, again, Mickey Waller, who played with Rod and Ronnie, Ron, Ron Wood in uh, uh, Jeff Beck Band, right? The original mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jeff Beck Band. And, and uh, so he introduced, Mickey introduced me to Rod and Rod was doing his second solo album, which was Gasoline Alley. And uh, so I came in and played on, on uh, piano on Country Comforts and then bass on a, uh, Eddie Cochran's song, Cut Across Shorty. That we, and Rod was covering those songs. And, um and um then and i you know and then with rod i did i did his next album as well next th uh, three albums i did uh, every picture tells a story and uh played playing piano i played a little bit of bass on a couple of his albums mm -hmm. but, but mostly piano and then um ian mcclagan played the b3 ian from the from the, from the uh, faces and Ronnie mm -hmm. Ron Wood, of course, played guitar and with Martin Quittington, who helped write a lot of that music. And um, and Ian was an amazing keyboard player. He played all the B3. And, but Rod, every every um, solo album that he did, he'd bring the faces in to the studio as a band to oh. record one track. Okay. They had, they had their own record label. See, right, they, right. And, and he'd bring them in. And so they did, on every picture tells a story that there's a great song, Losing You, was a great piano, and that's, that's Ian on piano on that song. But, but all the rest of the piano, for, for better or worse, that's me. You know? and, and then, then we went on to, um, but I go back and forth, you know. I joined uh, uh, Long John Baudry was on that album. And so 
he, uh, they, they asked me to play bass with him on his first US, first two US tours. And he was an amazing uh, uh, blues singer, you know, one of the original guys that sort of that part of that early British scene, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, so that was good. And then, uh, then, uh, and then I also did Never a Dull Moment with Rod. And then the last album I did with him was Smiler. Mm -hmm. and, so uh, were you just on the recordings for, for with him and or would you tour with him when you play live no, no, or no, no, mainly I, just studio I, stuff I, I was pretty much a session guy you know okay with, with rod he just he just brought me back for those four albums and that's uh, amazing though yeah i'd go to we'd go to go to his house in the afternoon and we he'd you know he'd, he'd play the song on an acoustic guitar or something and uh and then we'd go down the studio and there's usually like one take you know, mistakes and everything. He, all he cared about was, was the feel, really. You know, and it was a, uh -huh. and uh, it all sort of averaged out into this cool sounding thing. You know, and uh, so uh, that, I think every picture tells a story is one of the you know the favorite albums. I think I've, I've played on a lot of good albums and a lot of bad albums, but that is uh, got to be one of the best. I think you know it's just fills. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, and I think it, it spawned Maggie May. You know. Maggie May, all I played on that song was um, a Celeste, just a little, you hear a little dream noise, like a little toy piano sound near the end. And that's, but um, anyway, that was a good song. Um, yeah, that's like, I mean, that's obviously one of the biggest ones, right? I think it was Ray Jackson, was it? Mandolin, yeah. But um, anyway, yeah, so back and forth, you know, I ended up joining Jefferson. Well, I did a lot of blues stuff mm -hmm. um, and playing with John Cipollina you know, during those years and, um, you know, I met Nicky Hopkins and then I left Copperhead with John's band and Stone Ground with Tom Donahue and those guys. And, and then, and I, and then Nicky Hopkins asked me to, when I left Stone, when I left uh, Copperhead with John Cipollina, Nicky Hopkins, a piano player, asked me to play bass in a band he was getting together. And he went off on tour with the Stones and, um, and he rented me a, I did that album, Never a Dull Moment, mm -hmm. with Rod, and flew, had to fly back really fast to get, uh, take possession of the house that Nicky was renting me. And he, so in for San the first Francisco? time, for the, in... yeah, in okay. Mill Valley, in Green County. Yeah. For the first time, I had, uh, I had a house and some money to, uh -huh. uh, so I went and learned to fly, which I'd always wanted to do. So, oh, really? So, you learned yeah. how to fly a plane? Yeah, I started to get my pilot's license back then. No way, and, that's yeah, amazing. That, so I started the process during that period, and and then that everything fizzled out, and mm -hmm. but I carried on learning. You know, and got it, and that was became one of my passions for a while. You know, uh huh. The old bike, I like old things. You know, airplanes. And that's so cool. Boat. So yeah, I used to do aerobatic and an old biplane, and join the Tiger Club in Red Hill in England. And, uh huh. Through, through through their old tiger moth acdc and anyway uh, yeah no I, I, um, um wow <laughs> anyway so then no then carried on a bunch of different and jefferson starship well you, you played know. in jefferson starship for a while and then what became starship right yeah yeah i don't like to think about that much but too but but that it helps I'm sorry <laughs> no i'm joking, I'm joking. okay no, I saw, it's all good you know. um no I, the jefferson starship uh, it was almost an unrecognizable band from in night when I started it. I mean, started with the band in 1974, uh -huh. and we did our first album as a band, which was uh, Dragonfly. Mm -hmm. um, it became a sort of unrecognizable band to what became Starship, you know, suddenly in 1980 when Paul left in 84, 85. But but Starship was uh, very well produced, very very good playing um uh, you know it's it's uh, all good stuff you know but uh it just wasn't my cup of tea as they say you know mm -hmm. but, but mm -hmm. i left in 87 so. okay. but yeah but I've, I, I've interviewed I uh, david and if, donnie baldwin before for this huh? for the, i've interviewed yeah. donnie baldwin oh. and uh david fryer for the oh, for well, this two, yeah two of my dear friends i mean david freiberg and i david uh pretty much you know he uh, he I was playing in, um, you know, I played with John Cipollino. David was in Quicksilver with John, you know, mm -hmm. and um, Messenger Service. And so 
uh, I got to know David and then uh, I was co-producing an album for Kathy McDonald called Insane Asylum in, in San Francisco in 1973, early three. And, and then Grace was upstairs, Grace Slick was upstairs doing, um, recording a solo album called Manhole. And right. David was there, you know, with Paul Kantner. And so David invited me up and ended up playing on the album. So they are, that's when the, the idea of Jefferson Starship came about. But really? Paul had, yeah, he had done an album called Blows Against the Empire, which is a solo album mm -hmm. back in 1970. And he'd mentioned Jefferson Starship in little letters. The, I, the idea had come to him, you know. And so it be, and he, he wanted, and he told me he was going to try and get a band together called Jefferson Starship and uh, asked me to play. And then I went back to England to play with Rod and Smiler then came back and joined them in 74. They started out with Peter Kalkinen on bass, touring with them. Mm -hmm. But then their first um, Jefferson Starship as a band recording was Dragonfly. And that's when I joined and then went off. Then I was with them for 10 years. And then that sort of went through all these changes. And then with a big riot in, in um, Lorelei in Germany. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was. Um, oh, wow. I didn't hear that one. Oh, God. Yeah. The wild. purple air equipment threw it over. And uh, Grace was, oh, it's a long story. Grace oh, my was, God. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were, we were, it was our 1978. It was our, it was our um, big European tour. We were doing the idea. And, and then Grace, we we're in Laurel Light, which is an ancient amphitheater overlooking the Rhine River. And um, uh, there was, it was, it was an afternoon show and the audience was sitting through a light drizzle and one of the acts hadn't showed and we were the headline act. Mm -hmm. And so by the time, it was due for us to play. They were already pretty upset. And um, the, uh, but I was going in the second car because I had my wife, Jeanette, and my son, Dylan, who was only one year old, at the hotel in Wiesbaden. And um, so I came down to go, to go in the second car with uh, Paul and Grace and, and Marty Ballin and the manager. Mm -hmm. And I got these long faces and everybody was, and Grace was in a room, locked in a room, wouldn't come out. And she was sick and God knows what else. And, um, but usually that didn't stop us, you know, but, but Paul said, no way, you know, we can't go on without Grace. And, and so they, um, so we, 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 we instructed the um, uh, uh, road manager and David Freiberg, who was at the site to, um, uh, go out with the manager when we were with the promoter and tell the audience they could have their money back and we'd come back and play, <laughs> oh, you know, for free. You know, we, we, and he left that bit out, uh, the, the, having you given their money back. He left that because oh. he was in German and we didn't know what he was saying. Apparently. Right. And so the crowd went nuts. They started, they, they honestly thought we weren't there. You know, they, they thought that the, the, the German promoter, they were writing against him. Oh, they thought he just like, Put on yeah. this whole facade and then I took mean, their well, money. But on the it was other like a hand, fire fest. Yeah, all our equipment was there, ready to go. All our guitars, I lost all my guitars and oh. B3, my piano, all that stuff gone. That's and, a, oh uh, and then somebody got some gasoline, set fire to the stage. Somebody started chopping up the drums with an axe. Um, our roadies were falling, you know, with like wounds to their head. And, oh. uh, the whole thing was just. And then somebody slid at the stage and it, people were throwing stuff over the cliffs into the river. And uh, it was wow. a pretty intense thing. I, I mean, I, we were at the hotel, right? But um, yeah, but still, and, I mean, oh my God. But, but the next day I went out, there was like a bomb had gone off, you know. And so anyway, Marty, we, we went on to play Nebworth in England and uh, on the bill with Genesis. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they, uh, um, and Marty, you know, Grace flew back to the States instead of playing there. She flew back to go into rehab. And, and, um, and then we, uh, we did Nebworth without Grace on borrowed equipment. And um, just uh, Marty, uh, Marty uh, was going to carry on, you know, but we mm -hmm. got back to the States and he decided he had enough. And that was that. And so we, we, the band really took on a whole new sound after that. 
1980, mm -hmm. uh, beginning of 1980, 79, it, 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 new singers, new, um, well, Grace went away for one album and came back. Mm -hmm. So it was, she came back and um, different record producer. Uh, still a good band, but just different, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, it, but it, so the beginning of the ages was a, definitely still a rock and roll band. And um, and I, when when Grace left, I used to write songs with her, you know, like Hyperdrive was on the first album and things like that. But anyway, but I, uh, so my wife Jeanette and I uh, wrote songs together too. We always had, and, and um, so I started writing like songs like Stranger. Uh, Save Your Love and uh, uh, oh, wow. Winds of Change, some of those songs. That, uh, but then, uh, then new, we got a new record producer came in, and and he really wanted to take the band along with our vocalist Mickey, new new vocalist in a in a in a new direction, more commercial direction, you know, which I understand. And um, they uh, wrote uh, the producer wrote this song. A couple of some of our hits, you know, and uh, and so we band gradually went in this more commercial direction. Ended up in in the uh, the last album I did, which was Knee Deep in the Hoopla, mm -hmm. with Built the City and Rock and Roll, and then right. going to stop us now, uh, which uh, you know, and which so I wasn't happy at that point, <laughs> and. Um, well, but, what a change in direction! I would, you know, from what you yeah. guys were doing in Jefferson Starship to we built this city. Well, this is it. You know, it was a, a massive change. You know, but but it was well crafted. You know, I mean, we, mm -hmm. those. I mean, that that song was pretty much crafted on the on a sing clavier. You know, I mean, anyway. So, well, it's. A, I mean, it's still. It's everyone knows the song, right? I mean, it's such yeah. a timeless hit. That's that, true. Well, this is it. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's a it's a. It looms its head every now and again, in <laughs> yeah. some humorous, humorous way. It and, doesn't uh, matter. You hear that uh, song uh, anywhere, and you're like, "Oh, that, I know this one." <laughs> yeah, that, that, and that's fine with me. You know, it's just part of a long career. You know, and, uh, right? Exactly. Be, should be happy to have been a part of it. You know, so, so I'm. Anyway, then after that, went on to all kinds of stuff. You know, uh -huh. hot tuna. You did for a while. <clears throat> well, I, I plunged. Well, first I plunged back into the blues with Nick Rabinitis. Oh. Uh, born in Chicago, and uh, we, we, you know, we played Earth Day in 1990 at the, um, uh, Chrissy Field there, and that was a big, that was fun. And just, I loved playing with Nick. He's a, a great talent, and he wrote uh, for Janis Joplin as well. And uh, back in the day, and um, anyway, Nick, um, uh, Electric Flag, and all those guys. Uh, but we, uh, so I, I, I. I started playing the blues again you know that's that was really really enjoyable and and um then i was playing a saver benefit with um for wavy i see i used to volunteer to play in his cafeteria sometimes uh, a saver uh, um, is a non-profit that restored uh, sight to many people in india they would um uh you know wavy was was at woodstock a guy that's speaking at woodstock and mm -hmm. Uh, but 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 he and Larry Brilliant had, had started Saver together. I I first met those guys when I was playing with Stone Ground in 1970, mm -hmm. and uh, and they went on to India, you know, and uh, and they and so they formed Saver, which they would um, give uh, operations to the poor, to people that couldn't afford, people that were blind, and they they do cataract surgery and stuff like that. Wow. Uh, I mean, because. Larry Brilliant was a doctor, and so but they they really set this organization up. It was a massive organization now. They do all kinds of human rights work, and um, uh, Larry Larry Brilliant was um, instrumental in um, helping to eradicate uh, smallpox. You know, and um, he worked in India, wrote a book about it, and uh, and Wavy, of course, is just does amazing it does so much human rights work and has camp win a rainbow and he and i are real close we've done a lot of work together mm -hmm. and um yeah so uh that was uh that was uh, so i saw him years later you know mm -hmm. we worked together uh and um I was playing with nick and then i uh, and then i was playing at a saber show that's right and sorry 
<laughs> and no. and um, at least I remember what I was saying. Um, <laughs> and uh, and a lot uh, of years uh, like that you yeah. remember. I mean, a lot of different bands, no. right? It's not like you were like, no. yeah, I played in this one band for 25 years, well, and then I started this new. Yeah, band. I know. Well, You've been all. Afraid, you've, you know. Remember played what I said. with so many different people and so many legends. It's I don't know. I'm trying to remember what I said five minutes ago is not always easy. Um, so, uh, but anyway, but so, so I was playing in the cafeteria. I think Hot Tuna were were um, playing the bill on the main, the main one of the main acts, and Johnny Hooker, who mm -hmm. ended up playing years later too. But 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 um, so you know, I'm playing, and I was kind of in a kind of a melancholy sort of head down, just bluesy kind of thing. And I was just sort of, det or almost de detracted myself from that whole part of life, you know, that, that whole, um, the glamour part of the music business had no, I'd lost all interest in that at that point. And I was just kind of playing the blues with Nick and different things. And, and, um, and then I saw I was playing the, play, playing the uh, piano and, uh, my head down i got a tap on the shoulder looked up and it was yorma you know i'd met yorma years ago i knew jack a bit and, and um, um well, i knew back in his choir days uh, yorma when he made that before i joined jefferson starship because when i joined jefferson starship of course jack and yorma had nothing to do with the original jefferson starship but but they um uh, but they were but i so i kind of lost touch with those guys but anyway you know, yorma was tapping me on the shoulder he said you want to come down and sit in with hot tuna um, we're playing a show at the Sweetwater tomorrow. And so I came down and uh, sat in and then stayed 10 years. And <laughs> so Yorma, Yorma was wonderful, Yorma and Jack. And then when Jack wasn't around, I think he did end up playing with Paul, who'd left Jefferson Starship at that point. I mean, left, start, left to, to form his own, another version of Jefferson Starship, Next Generation. Mm -hmm. Jack played with them for a couple of years, um, I think in the 90s, right? And so this is the nineties I'm talking about now. And I, so I played, but when Jack was doing that, then I played with Yorma and the Yorma Kalkin and Trio and we toured all over Italy. So that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. He's a good, great, Yorma's wonderful in every, you know, in every way, man, just an amazing human being, an amazing um, singer uh, and plays this amazing picking guitar in the, in the Reverend Gary Davis style uh -huh. and um, just a great guy to be on the road with, you know, and here, Michael Falzerano, um, who's, you know, active in the, uh, heavily active as well, still right now. And then Yorma, I, I went on to play, uh, teach at his camp, Yorma, the Fur Piece Ranch Guitar Camp in Ohio. Really? <clears throat> Taught piano originally and then, and then, bass you know so mm -hmm. and you played with him what up through 2000 right At yeah least. i played with him did some work with john i uh, had my own band uh had an album called the long haul with a lot of friends on it and watch fire was back in 88 that album with mm -hmm. jeanette and i because we jeanette and i got involved in human rights pretty heavily you know mm -hmm. we were trying to help refugees in san francisco and who were uh, back in the uh uh mid to late 80s Mm -hmm. we, the refugees was fleeing the war, which a U.S. backed civil war in um, in the area and uh, in Guatemala and El Salvador, and that they would come to the Bay Area, flee there, um, uh, free, flee the violence, and but the INS would send them right back, and then they usually ended up they'd be they'd be killed the minute they were sent back, you know, sure by the right wing dictatorships, and. Um, so we were trying to help them and I did a food drive, you know, um, Jeanette and I would help try to, and we did a food drive uh, to raise food and clothing in the Bay, anyway, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We did an album called Watchfire about the, the rainforest and all that, all that stuff. Not a commercial thing, but, and, yeah. um, but, but we got it, you know, and Jeanette was, is a lyric, was a lyricist, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh -huh. and, and, and she, uh, wrote the words and we had Jerry Garcia, Jerry came down. He ended up put, putting the album on Grateful Dead Records. Really? Uh, so that's I a, got that's... it out on Holly Nears label, Redwood Records. And then, then it went to uh, Grateful Dead Records and, uh, for a while and then Relics. And, <clears throat> and now it's just any old place, you know, <laughs> and um, Spotify. <laughs> but, 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 um, 
anyway, yeah, later on, um, you know, the, the, after um, the end of Hot Tuna, um, I did the um, a Long Haul, which is, so I had John Lee Hooker uh, mm -hmm. play with him a couple of times in his live shows, but he came down and played on my album, which was nice. And, uh, and Francis Clay, Muddy Waters drummer, he's on the album. And uh, yeah, so anyway, we uh, and then um, then after that, uh, uh, I, I started playing with Roger McNamee in uh, in um, the Flying Other Brothers, and that was actually a lot of fun to do. And then that sort of morphed into Moon Alice. Right, I was going to say, didn't that kind of yeah. turn into what what the project now? Right, yes, yeah, that's members from the, Flying Other yeah. Brothers and you yeah. and that's right. It's gone through all these different versions, different variations, you know, and. Uh, where G. Smith and Jack was in the band for a while. Jack Cassidy was in the band for a while, and I played keys. And then, and then uh, just just gradually kind of moved around. And, and um, Roger played rhythm and rode and sang. And, and we had uh, Jimmy Sanchez on drums originally, and Barry Sless uh, is still playing guitar. He's the guitarist. And, um, and then John Molo joined the band uh, on drums when he wasn't out with Phil Lesh in, uh, in you know, playing and uh, and um with the phil and friends shows and john uh uh joined us and, and he's been with us ever since and then but then um you know we did a lot of work and it was fun but then when lester and dylan chambers joined and then the t sisters three amazing singers all great singers in their own right all three of them and all of a sudden, it was a world. Oh yes, okay, great. You know, it was just great to have to have them fronting the band and singing, and because we musically, you know, was, I mean, Barry's an amazing guitarist, and John's a great drummer, and, and Jason Crosby on uh, keys. Jason is, just plays keys and and uh, fiddle. Um, you know, he's out. I think he's out with Jackson Brown right now. I mean, he's just an amazing musician, and so we really enjoy playing with Lester because we get to play those old soul tunes mm -hmm. from Dylan uh, and the T-Sisters who, uh, I mean, just uh, we'd get to play all that stuff just with the real deal, you know? And yeah. Nice. Cause you've been, yeah. You've been able to kind of keep uh, building yeah. onto the band. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and the T-Sisters, they have their own, their songs they've introduced and, and we've uh, and they all sing individually as well as harmonies and and um, like woo woo as I say which was a late it was a single we released in in um, around New Year's Eve mm -hmm. and all these all these uh, singles are available in the streaming world right <laughs> which I don't know much about right oh, I was yeah. going to ask because like <clears throat> on your on Spotify you guys <clears throat> have a bunch of of EPs that like Dave's Way volumes one through eight. Yeah, tell me about uh, that. Yeah, that's right. There's, we got a lot of a lot of stuff. We got um, a lot of Dave Way albums before Lester and, and the T Sisters joined too. You okay, know, the old older Moon, Moon Alice songs, and, and they're available. Um, I think through MoonAlice.com. You know all those. Uh -huh. are, but um, uh, but you know we sort of I, I sort of I personally I can't speak for anybody else in the band. <clears throat> I view this as a new band, a different band, really. It's, it's, it's um, with this new record coming out. It's since Lester and, and the T Sisters and Dylan came on board. Um, it's it, it really it it to me it's just a whole new direction. You know, and and that's what the this whole this new the new music you've been releasing is a part of this is when you guys when you got the T Sisters and everybody else involved. Like, they, exactly. weren't, they weren't involved prior to that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and we still uh, we still do uh, like Barry and the band and I, we all go off in in a uh, in the middle of these tunes we go off in psychedelic jamming things. So we're still doing all that, you know. And uh -huh. and uh, and because a lot of the uh, some of Lester's songs actually lend themselves to that because uh, they were one of the sort of original psychedelic soul bands, really, with time, mm -hmm. that time has come today, you know, and then this new song, Let's Get Funky, you know, that's pretty much stays in the funk groove of the whole thing, but things like Time and Love, Peace and Happiness, another of their songs that we do, um, in the middle, it goes into free form sections, uh, psychedelic, and it always did when the Chambers Brothers recorded mm -hmm. them. They always had that psychedelic moment 
uh, where they would go into the improvisational. Um, so they played a result band, but they just went into the psychedelic thing too. And so we, it was like perfect for us because, you know, we already did a lot of this psychedelic um, improvisational stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a medium to, to go there as well, you know. Sure. Yeah, because even Time Has Come Today, the Chamber Brother version is like seven minutes, isn't it? It's like a really long song. Oh yeah, yeah. It's got it's got its share of jamming. And, uh, yeah, in that and, and on the original recording. Well, yeah. They, I mean, they had to obviously the, 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 there was a you know the, the it was a big hit, radio hit too, mm -hmm. uh, which was that was edited down, right? Of course. Yeah, like, of course. Like 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 uh, like when I was with Jefferson Starship, we did we had a number one hit single called "Do You Believe in Miracles," right? Uh -huh. I played bass and piano on that song, but but that was originally like seven or eight minutes long, maybe longer. <laughs> the album version but the but the single was just three three and a half right because you had to do that for radio mm -hmm. well yeah i'm i'm i've worked in radio for a long time that's how yeah, we well, you know lived this. in san francisco and, and all that so i yeah i know how they they nowadays they even change if a song is too slow they will speed it up to put it on more of like a top 40 format it's it's really they, interesting oh, yeah. how that works interesting. cut I off did, the whole I, intro to make sure that goes like because people's attention spans now is what, like three to five seconds. So if they don't start hearing yeah. the vocal right away, it's, yeah. they already have changed the channel. <laughs> it's yeah. quite oh, the yeah. world. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I didn't know they actually sped that stuff up. But <laughs> Some of it, when it goes, it depends on the record, but like, if you hear a song, I come from alternative radio, so we would play yeah. the most original version yeah. of it, unless yes. it was like, a, they chopped something down out of it, but once it would yeah. cross over into the pop top 40, there, there would always be some like subtle remix to it where it would speed up the BPM to make it right a little bit more like upbeat for people. If it was too yes. slow, it had to hit a certain register of BPM to make it like more, you know, there's no, probably get... some study behind it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It started, that kind of thinking started out in the disco period you know and it's like mm -hmm. it, it, in a way disco was the kiss and death for soul music a lot of great funk so, funk music you know was just suddenly got swallowed up in disco you know and it's like and uh everything had to be a certain pumping kind of rhythm right mm -hmm. because it's good to dance to i mean I, under, I understand why these things happen and it's um and it's it's like you know fine if that's what it's really all about entertainment, isn't it? I mean, we can all, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, obviously you, you, you can go off and improvise and do everything and just have fun improvisation or on, on your instrument and interacting with band members. And you get really some of the finest moments of when the band is interacting together, you know, mm -hmm. and just moving together without thinking, you know, that's, that's the best time, but <clears throat> You know, but there are times when uh, you you realize that wait a minute, it's, it's entertainment, isn't it? It was supposed to be <laughs> right. It's right. Us. It's about well, there's an audience out there. You know? And the <laughs> best times are when the, the best times are when the audience is feeding the band, and the band is feeding the audience. It's cyclical, really. You know? Yeah, they're the moments when the roof the roof lifts off. You know? mm -hmm. And you'll have that experience again here soon enough, right? I get you get to get off back on the road. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that's it. I hope so. And, uh, so uh, you know, we're doing those, doing going up and down the West Coast. You know, and, um, uh, we're playing uh, Felton coming up in a in a week or two here, and mm -hmm. down in San Cruz, and then we're playing um, the Sweetwater. You know, and uh, in Mill Valley mm -hmm. coming right up, and then we're going to be moving to uh, going to be, I think, probably around April. You know. Around that period, we have, we have a uh, a single uh, around four twenty, around April four twenty. Yeah, uh, April twenty, we have a uh, an EP with, of these all the singles. Uh -huh. um, plus, people get ready. I think included. Uh, it's going to be coming out. We're going to release in that. And you're doing so, the four twenty fest right in San Francisco. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We do that, and then um, and then we're moving. Uh, uh, we're going to go up and down the west coast, and then uh, yeah, after. Labor Day, I think. I think in September we're going to be moving, doing some dates on the east East Coast, and awesome. and in Ohio, places like that. So. Exciting, exciting. Well, thank you so much, Pete, for doing this. I really, really appreciate your time. This has been so much fun, and it's so cool to hear your stories of you know all the 
these years that you put into this industry. I really appreciate it. Well, yeah. All right. Thank you. I mean, sorry about the rambling. But, no, uh, <laughs> that's what this is about. It's, it's about the rambling. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I just I had a, a, just finished up a new uh, the, a band I played with in 1969 called Steamhammer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we just uh, we, we were going to get we we're supposed to play Glastonbury in 2020. Then COVID hit. That was canceled. Oh, so, so now we ended up recording an album. So that's kind of fun. It's coming out in June. On that's a journey. amazing. We're going to make a vinyl record of it. That is yeah, so cool. Steamhammer. Blues, British blues, good old style British blues. Uh, they were Freddie King's UK backing band back in the day. And uh, wow, well, that's not Martin Pugh, the guitar player, John Lingwood on drums, Phil Colombotto. Yeah, we that we haven't actually played live in a long time, but uh, but we're, we're going to do that at some point too. Just uh, but um, yeah, and and the David Nelson band, you know, we do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fewer and um. Zero, I've been playing with Steve Kimmock and Zero a lot. We're supposed to have played the film or uh, last week, but that was canceled because of the COVID thing. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, but uh, that's one of so, my favorite venues, the film yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, just keeping it all together, trying to keep it all going. And uh, to my wife, Jeanette, wrote a book, you know, I called mm -hmm. a novel, A Light Rain of Grace, which uh, has a really nice foreword by Grace Slake and Ben Fon Torres. Wow. So anyway, we're just um, trying to make it all work. It, I, I swore I'd get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. All right. Um, well, P, I have one more quick question for you before yeah. I let you go. Do you have any advice for aspiring artists? Uh, yeah, practice. <laughs> I like one it. One day you'll say, God, I wish I'd practice more. You know. Bring me the bad words.